I treat it. When you think about Jesus, um, we came up with all sorts of different names for Jesus, right? And a lot of those names really get tied to things that Jesus does. That's why I mentioned the Creator, Sustainer, Prayer, Redeemer, Sustainer. Um, so who said Lamb of God? Okay, Lamb of God. Tell me why we use Lamb of God. Because he was sacrificed. And we talk about that sacrifice of the Lamb. And so um, the most perfect uh, sacrifice is as... Um, as Jesus being sacrificed, right? Giving his life. And we had a Messiah. Somebody said Messiah over here. Forget who said it. And we, remember what the word Messiah means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anointed one. Anointed one, all right? Um, so the anointed one is that special one who's lifted up to do something special. Often they become the king. So often when a king, when a king is anointed, they, you know, that, that's when they start to become a king, okay? It's that anointing ceremony. Well, that's done in a lot of different ways. You've seen the thing with a sword in England where they dub you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, often you put a crown on them, right? And so, the anointing. Any other words that we had? <laughs> so one of the cool names I like is Lion Tribe of Judah. Lion, tribe of Ju Lion of the tribe of Judah. So who is Judah? Remember we get the name Jew from that tribe, Judah. So it's one of the 12 tribes of Israel, which, if you think back, is 12 what's of Jacob. 12 children. <laughs> you have to take the sucker out of your mouth. The 12 children or sons of Jacob, right? He had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of them was named Judah. Judah becomes that um, one of the strong tribes, and so they refer to Jesus as the Lion of the tribe. So that strong leader that comes out of the out of the tribe of Judah. David also came out of the tribe of Judah. Okay, and they keep referring to the Messiah as the the son of David. All right, so often they refer to him as the son of David. So I want us to think about Jesus as King tonight. I told you that we're, we're looking at Jesus. There's, there's so much to look at Jesus. I mean, he's, there's so much that we could get into all the stories, all the different miracles, all the different teachings he did, all the different healings he did. But I'm trying to break it into three major parts. So we already had prophet. I'm going to separate you guys and keep talking. So we already had the first one, which was prophet. Jesus is prophet. And then we had Jesus as priest. We talked about that last week. So tonight, I want us to think about Jesus as king. All right? And think about that re in that regard. Because a lot of this gets tied to that idea of Messiah, the anointed one. Um, because before Jesus gets on the scene, the people are waiting for the Messiah. In fact, if you're a Jew today, you're still waiting for the Messiah. I told you that already, right? Mm -hmm. So the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. That's an important part. So remember the um, Christmas story. We're gonna have the we're gonna we're gonna be hearing the Christmas story a lot real soon, right? So I have it up in front of us. It's not even December, but they're already selling Christmas presents, aren't they? They've been selling Christmas presents for the last three weeks. Maybe even before that. Matthew 2. Do you guys recognize this? In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east, came to Jerusalem, asking where is the child has been born, King of the Jews. So, those three wise men that come looking for Jesus, they're looking for what? They're looking for a king. Right? It's, it's a baby. They know it's a baby, but it's, it's, it's a born, uh, born child who will be the king of the Jews. And they know this because it's been foretold. Right? The prophecies. Remember that we talked about prophets? They foretell the future. And there's a lot of prophecies about the Messiah. And so they say, so we've observed his star and its rising and have come to pay him homage. So they come looking in Bethlehem um, for this baby that's going to be the king. And that comes out of one of the prophecies that the, the new um, king will be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem's a really little tiny city, by the way. 
Okay, when you go to that area, it's not a big city. It's a tiny city. It's not very far from Jerusalem. It's about, I think it's like three miles away from Jerusalem. So it's very close. But it's considered the city where David lived. And remember how that's important because the son of David, you know, it's part of that lineage. And remember how Mary and Joseph, what did they have to do? She was, she was expecting a baby, but they had to go and, and they had to go and get what? They had to make this long journey because why? Yeah. They were doing a census. They were doing a census. You guys know what a census is? Yeah. You track the population. Exactly. I couldn't have said that better myself. So every 10 years in our country, we do a census. So um, sometimes it's done personally where people go door to door if they can't get answers from people. Or they'll mail it to your house. And they mail it to your house and they ask you, okay, in this house, who's living here? How many people are here? What's your, what's your ethnic background? What's your, what's your race background? What, um, you know, they ask all sorts of questions so they get a sense of, okay, if you look at Wauwatosa, it's made up of, you know, 72% white people and 28%, you know. And so they, they want to get a sense of who's living in town and how many people. Why did Wauwatosa go down so far? It, it hasn't, but, you know, they're trying to understand how the city is changing and they do this nationally. Yes? Um... So, was Jesus born on the Sabbath day then? Was Jesus born on the Sabbath day? We don't know exactly what day of the week he was born. And in fact, if you really want to get technical about it, we don't really know that it was December 25th. Yeah. Okay? So we all celebrated on, tw on the 25th. And that's, that's because hundreds of years after Jesus was born, people started to want, started to, they wanted to start having a Christ Mass. Christ worship service. And they did it at the time where they were making the point that we call Jesus the light. That's another name for Jesus, right? The light. The light was coming into the world. It comes out of the Gospels. The light was coming into the world. What is the darkest time of the year? Um, the 21st of December. Right around the, the solstice, right? The 21st of December. That's, that's the darkest time of the year. And the new light was is coming into the world. So those days are starting to get just a little bit longer and that light is starting to push its way in. So they're making a point that if we have a service right now, we're making a point about who this person is, who Jesus is. And he's the light coming in the world. Okay? So, um, so we celebrate Jesus' birthday on the 25th of December, but that's more than likely not the actual day. It's the day that the service takes place. Okay? But we call it Jesus' birthday, and that's important. Um, so here's another Christmas passage. You guys see that up there? Um, Luke 1. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Who's the Most High? God. Yeah, another, another time the Sunday school answer works, right? Good. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. So throne means what? Kingdom, right? A big fancy chair, which is not just a big fancy chair. It has, it has symbolism to it. It has power to it. It's where the person that's in charge sits. So he's going to have the throne of his ancestor David, the greatest king in the Old Testament. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Okay? So that we're talking about a king here, right? I mean, that the angel is prophesying that a king is coming. Okay? And this king is going to be born to Mary. So the angel is talking to Mary and saying this. Here's another Christmas passage. In that region, there were shepherds living in the field. You guys remember all this, right? We get this, right? Living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news, of great joy for all the people. For to you this is born this day in the city of David. What's the, what's the city of David? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It's also called the city of David. Who is the Messiah? And what does Messiah mean? 
No. No. You're going to keep turning out words. It's not know what you're saying. What does Messiah mean? The anointed one. And when is it? When is the person normally anointed? When they are king. Okay. So who is the Messiah? So here the angel is telling the shepherds, this baby is the Messiah. Now, like I've said to you, for hundreds of years, they've been waiting for the Messiah. More than hundreds of years. I mean, centuries they've been... More than centuries, right? Thousands of years they've been waiting for the Messiah, the promised one. And so here the angel is saying, this is the Messiah. No need to keep looking. This baby is the Messiah. All right? The Lord. Now, um, I wanted us to stop right here real quick. Um, these are some passages that start to point to that Jesus is the king, is, is like a king. And I want us to think a little bit about royalty. So, in your group right now, take uh, a second and brainstorm other words for royalty. And um, have somebody write them down, and you're going to come up and share them at the microphone. Somebody will come up. So come up with a bunch of words that go with royalty. Royalty. between a ruler 
and a lord. A ruler and a lord. What's the difference? So in your group, discuss it. Okay, so the Lord our God, and you'd say rules from heaven, okay? We'll just stop there. Okay. So we often call Jesus Lord, and there is a sense of in that that's almost about being a king, being a ruler, but um, there's there's a there's a little difference there, and it's trying to figure out what the difference is. Um, I want to keep moving through different scenes that go along with Jesus where he gets lived out as as king or seen as someone uh, special. This is a scene from um, a Jesus movie at the baptism of Jesus. So this is John the Baptist baptizing out in the wilderness. Telling them to repent. Be ready for the coming of the kingdom. Let your hearts not be troubled. Forgiveness. I have sinned. Help me to be strong. Be strong. Eternal 
Father, I hear your voice. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. One of the scenes where we have Father speaking, um, God the Father, God the Creator, if you want to use that language, um, speaking. We have Jesus the Son there, and we have the Holy Spirit that said, in the baptism, the Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. Remember that part? All right. So, one of the parts to that, what's important is that sense of um, we, we talk about the Messiah as the son of David, but also the son of God. So this is, this is a distinction where God actually speaks and says, this is my beloved son. This, this carries a lot of weight in terms of who Jesus is. Okay. Um, so this is, this is that passage. And when Jesus had been baptized just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. All right. um, so then... Um, remember how we talked about prophets have authority? Do kings have authority? Do royalty have authority? Um, give, give me a definition. I mean, when, think about think about um, royalty, leaders, kings, queens. What makes them a good king or queen? Yeah. They listen to their people. Okay. They listen to their people. What else? Say it again. They do what's best for the people. All right? Um, not just what's best for them. All right? That's a major distinction. What's best for the people. A good king or queen does what's best for the people. What else? Any other things that define, make a good king or queen? Yeah. I can't hear you. Sorry. They wouldn't take advantage of their power. Okay? They wouldn't take advantage of their power. And they've got they've got ultimate power, right? And I told you that story of King David, right? Where he um, abused his power as king, had um, had an affair with um, with Bathsheba, had her husband sent off to be killed. You know, that whole story. He abused his power there, didn't he? Any other thoughts on what makes a good king or queen? Yeah, or bad king or queen, the opposite. Um, yeah. They're humble. They're humble, okay? Being humble. You already have one? Yeah. Already have one. Yeah. Um, one thing that makes them bad is like if they take over everything and make everyone their slaves. Okay. So if they abuse their power, right? Not even abuse their power. Do you like sweet or sour? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Um, and they essentially take, I mean, that was that passage I read from you when we had that skit, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, right? That was a passage where God was saying, you don't want a king because this is what the king's, king's going to do to you. He's going to take all your best stuff. He's going to take your best land. He's going to take your sons and daughters. He's going to, you know, he's going to take everything. You don't want that, you know. But a good king thinks about the people, thinks about um, the people they're serving. Yeah. A bad example would yeah. be King Jong-un. Okay, so a bad example would be a ruler like King, Kim Jong-un over in, in North Korea, right? Because it's it's not about the people, right? The people are literally um, really struggling personally over there. And he's um, abusing that power. Yeah, exactly. So, one more. Annabelle. A good king is honest, a bad you are going. A bad king would steal. Okay. So when we think about this, we're thinking about now 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 turn on Jesus. If we call Jesus our king, is he a good king or a bad king? He's a good king, and why? 
So he literally gives himself up for his people. Right? He literally gives not, not just like his possessions up. He gives his life up. Right? What else? So he really hears and understands what people are going through, what, they, what their lives are, right? And has compassion. Often says, and he had compassion for them. You know, when you have compassion for someone, it's your, you're trying to really understand and hear what they're going through. You know, how many times do you say to a friend, hey, how you doing? Go out past you, give them a high five. How you doing? And they go, really bad. You're like, oh, uh, uh, that's too bad. Okay, see ya. Right? That's not, that's not very compassionate, is it? To, to say, how are you doing? And then have them say, well, actually, you know, um, I'm not doing real well today. This just happened to me today. I asked a lady, how are you doing? And I just met her. She goes, not real well. Um, today's the anniversary of my husband's death. He died two years ago, and every time this comes around, I, I'm, ha I'm having a hard time getting out of bed, I'm having a hard time dealing with this. And you can just tell how heavy her emotions were, you know? I felt really bad for her, so I tried to talk with her and, you know, see how she was doing and ask her what was going on and tell me about your husband. And so compassion means you try to listen, you try to understand, and you Try to empathize, and um, you, pr you can't take it away, right? But often, I bet when you've had trouble or stress or things wrong in your life, when someone comes on and actually listens, you know, it makes you feel better, doesn't it? It's kind of like you're, you're able to unload a little weight. You're a little, a little emotional weight. And so that talking process is really important. So that understanding, like you said, Jesus had compassion, Jesus listened, Jesus understood. And people came to him. People came in droves because they wanted to be around him. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Um, so this is a passage um, that's kind of famous. So uh, Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? So, he's gotten pretty famous. People, I mean, thousands of people are like, hearing where he is, and they run ahead to meet and be there when he gets there. So, I mean, imagine you were doing this. You're walking along and people are following you, right? And Jesus knows that people are really following him and trying to get close and trying to get, you know, it's almost like they want his autograph or, you know, or whatever. But, so he turns to the disciples and he says, so who do people say that I am? Because it really gets to a question of, who is this guy, Jesus? And he wants to hear what all the people are saying. And right before this passage, the other disciples are saying, well, some are calling you a prophet, some are calling you a rabbi, some are calling you a great teacher, some are calling you Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets. And one of the prophecies would that would be that Elijah would return, you know, and uh, um, he was one that went up to heaven. They're waiting for him to come back to heaven um, in the fiery chariot, um, and that they're saying some are calling you Elijah. And then he turns to them and he says, "Now who do you say that I am?" So that's a whole different question, right? Who, who does that? Who does the who does the crowd say that I am? Wow, you're you're this great teacher. No, but who do, you, who do you guys say that I am? You've been following me along for almost two years. Um. <laughs> Everybody wave a duck. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So they've been following him along for two years and, um, and listening, and they've been as close as anybody could be. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, blessed are you... Um, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So remember, this Messiah is really important because it's this future king. It's the king that's going to come. And what do they all think this king is going to do? The magical being. 
What do they think this king is going to do? Yeah. Fix all their problems. What are their problems? What are the Israelites' problems right now? Anybody know? Yeah. Uh, the Romans are their problem. Remember how they got taken away? Israel gets taken away, never comes back. Judah gets taken away as well. They come back, but they don't get to rule themselves. So it's almost like you come back to Autosa and the Russians are in charge now. I'm, I'm just making up stuff here. Um, so the Romans are now in charge, and you will pay taxes to the Romans. You will you will honor their gods. You will you will do all the things that they tell you to do, and you don't like it because this is your promised land. Do you remember that promise? What was the promise? Descendants and land. This land, God said, I'm giving to you. So they go. God gave us this land. This is ours. But we're not in charge. We're not really owners of this land anymore. So this is a problem. So they're waiting for a king to come back that'll do what? Free them. A king that will come back and get rid of the Romans. Okay? They want the Romans gone. They want to be in charge of themselves again. They want to have a theocratic society. You know what a theocratic society is? Theo is, yeah, it's a religious-led society, a theocratic society. Theo is God, God-led society. So they want to be um, like they were once before. And they're, they're waiting for the Messiah to come and do this. This new king who will ride in, ride into town, and kick the Romans out. Is that what Jesus looked like? Is that the kind of king Jesus was? I want to show you another video. So, um, when Jesus is finishing his ministry, he comes to Jerusalem. Now, it's really important to understand Jerusalem because Jerusalem is up on a hill. So the whole country goes up to Jerusalem. Okay? So Jerusalem is, um, in a way, a really well-fortified city, naturally, because three sides of the city um, all slope up. So they don't have to have these, they have huge walls, but they don't, they don't have to as much because of the way the natural form of the city is. They only really have to fortify one major side of the city. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem and they're saying this new king is coming, right? In fact, here I have it. I'm going to read this first and I'll show you the video. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go in the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone's asked if anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs it. So, um, Jesus refers to himself as what? The Lord. The Lord needs it. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet. Remember? The prophet said this way in advance. At least more than how many years? How, was, how long ago silence was there? 400. So more than 400 years before, the prophet said this. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So your new king, and that they define that king as who? The anointed one, or in other words, the Messiah. So the Messiah will ride into, the, ride into Zion, Jerusalem, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They, they brought the donkey and the colt, put their cloaks on them, and sat on them. A very large crowd appeared, spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went out ahead of him, and they followed, were shouting, Hosanna to who? The Messiah. The son of David. Who's the son of David? The Messiah. 
Okay? They're defining him as the Messiah is here. The Son of David is here. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So they're saying, here comes our Messiah, and they're excited. Do you think the, do you think the Romans are excited about this? <laughs> Not in any, any bit. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is a big deal when this happens. We celebrate this on what day? Palm Sunday. overturn them, and so they're getting really nervous anytime a movement like this takes place. They get really nervous, and they're waiting for this happen. In fact, um, it didn't technically happen in Jesus' time, but 70 AD, so nearly 70 years after Jesus died, there was a major uprising where they tried to do exactly that, they, the, the Maccabean uh, revolt where they came in and they tried to take over and get rid of the Romans, and the Romans squashed it, and then to make a, to make a point, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed um, a lot of their sacred um, artifacts, and um, really made um, a horrible scene. I wanted to show you this. Um, so, this is uh, the Mount of Olives. Can I zoom in there? Okay. So... Um, so I told you where the Wailing Wall was, right? The Wailing Wall is right. Um, where is the Wailing Wall? So the Wailing Wall is essentially over, it's over here. So, um, I think this is it right there. And it's in that corner. Um, right now, uh, this is a famous uh, mosque on top, the rock, the golden uh, dome of the rock. 
So this is believed to be the spot where uh, Muhammad ascends to heaven. And so they built a temple over it. That's a gold leaf temple over the top. So this is where the temple was, um, right in that spot. And I messed this up. <laughs> what am I doing? Um, so this whole hillside here uh, walks down. Um, this is where Jesus came. He came down this hillside and down the path, coming down the hillside. And I don't have a picture of this side. But the opposite view is you're going down the hill towards the, towards the um, holy city. So like I said, on that side, it's got a really low valley ravine. So it's perfect to protect the city. So troops can't just rush in. Okay? Um, but he, this, this Mount of Olives that he, stop doing that, that he walks down is right there. This, um, this building here is a temple um, where they believe he ascended, went to heaven. So they have a temple over that, and there's a stone on the ground that shows a footprint that says, well, this is where Jesus, you know, when he ascended, it created a footprint, but, you know, whatever. Um, What's interesting is, guess what these are? They're more than rocks. Those are graves. Um, why do you think there's all these graves here? Any good guesses? Any Jewish scholars here? Yeah, why? But it is a holy place, yes. What? You, you probably won't get it, but we'll keep going. Yeah. A few ideas. Um, uh, maybe, or probably. That's where Jesus came in. No, and it's not about Jesus. These are Jewish. These are Jewish um, graves. This is this is the this is the best place to be buried in the world for a Jew. And in fact, you know what they're doing right now? Because there's no more room. You know, it's been filled for thousands of years. So what they're doing? What they're doing is they're actually digging underneath them and they're making new spots to bury underneath because this is believed um, that when the Messiah arises the Messiah will come out of the gate that is right here this gate here so the Messiah will walk out that gate and all those that have died will come alive and the first to come alive will be the ones that are right in front of that gate so they believe, you know, you get buried there, this is it. This is the best spot. You know, you're going to come to life right away. And so people literally, I mean, that's this whole thing is, is a graveyard. And this, you can see the path where, where they walked down. <laughs> Messing this all up. What is this doing to me? Okay, stop it. Um, okay, um, okay, anyway. <laughs> Okay, well, I was trying to turn it, but okay. Anyway. So anyway, that whole hillside, um, it's a beautiful view. When you come in, that's the best, best spot to see the city of Jerusalem. Moving on. All right, let's get back to that. So, Jesus comes into the city. Um, this is Palm Sunday. Now we celebrate this, we call this Holy Week. So Holy Week starts off on Palm Sunday, where we all wave palms, and we celebrate Hosanna, you know, to the Son of David, our King is coming into the city, and what happens at the end of Holy Week? Aiden, what ends up, what ends up at the end of Holy Week, Aiden? Um, uh, no. Think about it. Palm Sunday, and then a few days later, Easter's at the end of the week. What's in between? What's right before Easter? Mardi Gras starts Lent. Was it? Jesus crucified. We call that what day? Good Friday. Good Friday. Um, so Good Friday is the day that Jesus is, is killed. Now, right before that day, on Monday, Thursday, he's handed over. So, 
um, they go to celebrate the Passover event. Okay? But, oh God. Um, they go to celebrate the Passover event. And um, when he's handed over, he's handed to Pilate. Yeah. Why is it good when Jesus dies on this day? You tell me. Why would you call that good? Something new. Yeah. Uh, we're forgiven for our sins because of sacrifices and stuff. So it was terrible for Jesus, it was great for us. Right? Is one way to say it. Right? It was, it was Jesus, the Lamb of God, dies for our sins. So imagine all the things you've ever done wrong in your life, somebody is willing to give their life for those things. We call it Good Friday, even though it's a, a horrible day. It's a day where we are given an incredible gift. Okay? Now, um, keeping, keep thinking about Jesus as king. I want to read this. This is long. Um, then Pilate entered the headquarters. So Jesus has been handed over to be crucified. He's been handed over to Pilate, who is a Roman authority. Do you remember the Romans are really nervous about Jesus? They're really nervous about what's going on. And they need to make us they need to give an example of what happens to people that cause a ruckus. What kind of example could they make? They could kill the person that makes a ruckus. And they often did. The people that caused a stir, they often just have them crucified. So, um, but Pilate um, has kind of a whole different thing here. So then Pilate entered the headquarters again. This is really small. Um, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? So what, what is Pilate calling him? The king of the Jews. And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Now is that the right thing to say to someone? If they're your judge? Is that the right thing to say if you're trying to calm things over? Who told you, who told you to call me that? Right? Did somebody tell you about me? Pilate replies, I'm not a Jew, am I? I'm a Roman. Your own nation and your chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? You know, what have you done that you've got everybody so upset with you? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Where is his kingdom? Heaven, right? It's, 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 it's God's kingdom, right? Pilate asked him, so you are a king. You know? And do you think Romans like people coming in and calling themselves king? No. No. So if you call yourself a king, that's one of the fastest ways to get yourself killed. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. So notice his answer here. Does Jesus say I'm a king? He says, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? And that's where they leave it. After, this, he had said, after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again. Pilate goes out to the Jews and tells them, I find no case against this man, Jesus, but you have a custom that I can release anyone to you at the Passover. So it's a Passover event, right? What's the Passover event? Yeah? It's where they had to put lambs all over the door so that the, the, pass, the angel of death would pass over. Right? Exactly. Good job. And they finally got out of Egypt and they celebrated every year. So this is the event Jesus was celebrating. This is the time he is killed on the Passover. And they had this special, um, special gift that the Romans give to the Jews that they'll release one of their captives. Um, believing that one of these captives may be innocent. So all the Jews come together and say, let go of the innocent man. And so do you want me to release the king of the Jews, Jesus? And they shout a reply, not this man, don't release Jesus, but give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit, a horrible bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Do you know what means to be flogged? It's where you're whipped but you're whipped with um, a, that has cords. So it's not just like one single whip, it's cords. And on the ends of the cords they put bone and metal. So when it goes across the skin, it rips the skin open. So imagine your entire back being ripped open. 
all your muscles, okay? And the belief was if you did it 40 times, the person, no person could survive 40 lashes, okay? Um, so Paul actually says, I was, I, was, I was scourged 39 times. I went all the way to 39. That's what Paul says when he talks about it. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns. So think about thorns. You guys ever seen a, seen, seen a thorn bush? Not like the little thorns, but like the really big thorns. I should have Gretchen go get our, our sample crown of thorns up in our sacrist, old sack. Yeah, we've got a, there should be a box up there with a crown of thorns. They took a crown of thorns. Um, I lost my place. They took a crown of thorns, they, they dressed him in purple. Oh, they took the crown of thorns and put it on his head. So did they nice and neatly set it on his head? What do you do with royalty? We just talked about this. What do you give royalty? You give them a crown. This crown was thorns that they dug into his head. So imagine the thorns going into the skin around his head. You think that hurt? Yes. Just after he had been scourged? And then um, they dressed him in purple. What's, what's a royal color? Purple. They put him in a royal robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let, him, let you know that I find no case again. So Pilate had actually had a dream that told him, or his, his, his wife had had a dream that you want to let this guy go because Jesus is innocent and there's going to be big things to pay if you, if you have him crucified. So you need to let him go. Through a dream he was told that. So Pilate's trying to let him go because he knows this dream. And so he's trying, and so he, he beats him, he does all these horrible things to him, trying to make a point. Okay, I made my point, now I'm going to let him go. That's what he's trying to do. Right? Uh, let's see, Pilate went out again and said, look, I'm bringing him out to you and let, it, let you know that I find no case again. Look what I just did to him. He's beaten to a bloody pulp. So Jesus comes out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. What does he look like? He looks like a king. And Pilate says, um, here's, here's the man. When the chief priests and the police saw them, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. I want to let him go. And the Jews answered him all the more. They became a mob. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. So do you remember what I said? What did God? What what name did God use when he to, when he told Moses his name? Remember that part? I you want to guess? I am. I am. Right? There's a section I'm not showing you here where he says where the priests are saying, "Are you the Son of God? Are you saying you're the Son of God?" And he says, "I am." And that's that's the same language that Moses used that Moses heard that they know very well, as soon as he said that, they call it blasphemy. You're saying you're God. And you're, that you, they kill you. They stone you, usually. So, so they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him. I'm not going to do this. The Jews answered, we have a law. Blah, blah, blah. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid of them. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus. He's going to Jesus going, come on, dude. I'm trying to let you go. I'm trying not to kill you here. Give me something. Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus stands there silent. So Pilate's trying to get some sort of answer where Jesus might just say, you know what? Big misunderstanding. You know, everybody's all worked up. Let's all just take a deep breath here. Let's just all calm down. Let me go. I'm really sorry for what I got started. You know, I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to be a good guy. I don't know why everybody else. He was looking for, Pilate's looking for Jesus to say something. What does Jesus say? Nothing. nothing. Silent. He gave him nothing so that um, Pilate could, could not, Pilate wanted to release him, he got nothing from Jesus. And he says, um, so Pilate therefore says to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, so is this another good thing to say to someone? You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. 
Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of claims to be a, uh, I'm reading this wrong. guilty of a greater sin. Then, then on Pilate tried. Then, from then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out even more. If you release him, you are no friend of the emperor. We're going to tell the emperor on you. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the, Pente- for the Passover. It was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. Does that sound like king language? Pretty much, yeah, that is. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked him, shall I crucify your king? So there, he's, Pilate's actually making him angrier. The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. So the, the priests, who normally would only give allegiance to God, remember how that whole thing came about right after the judges? We want a king, we want a king, we want a king. Right? The, the, um, so here's, here's a crown of thorns. Oh my God. This one. This is a crown of thorns. This is a real crown of thorns. So imagine this going into your skull, in your skull. So, um, so the, the priests do not believe in giving allegiance to Caesar. They believe in only giving allegiance to God. God is their king. They learned their lesson a long time ago that they only have one king that's God. And here they're saying, they're actually saying, no, we have no king but the emperor. So they're actually um, harming themselves. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So Pilate hands him over. So they took Jesus, carrying the cross by him by himself. He went out, was called to the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha. There they crucified him, one with, uh, with him, two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also had the inscription. This is important. I want this to be on your final exam right here. Pilate also had an inscription written on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So when you when you um, are crucified, above your head, they put your crime. They write your crime. Theft, murder, rape, you know, whatever the crime is that you're being killed for, they write it. What did, Jesus, what did Pilate write above his head? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Um, so he's actually giving him a title, isn't he? He's giving him the king, the title of king. Um, and um, many of the Jews read this, in, read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And um, it was written in, you're going to need to know this for your final exam, what three languages is it written in? Hebrew, Hebrew Latin, and Greek. Yeah, Hebrew. So, this, these are the languages of the people at that time. Hebrew, Latin was the Roman language, and then Greek. Okay, well, Greek was also Greek. So, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And then, um, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. They realize that the priests realize, don't give them that title. We didn't say that, you know. And um, you need to take that down, they're essentially saying. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered him, what I have written, I have written. So, um, so Pilate wouldn't take it down. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four parts, one for each shoulder. They took his tunic, now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from, pot, from, from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear the tunic, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. And this was to fulfill another prophecy. Um, they divided my clothes amongst them, and for my clothes they cast lots. So that's another messianic prophecy. All right? So this whole scene is living out to show that Jesus is his king. But is he the kind of king that they've been waiting for? Is he going to be the strong, burly king that rides in on a horse and, and conquers the Romans and kicks them out, leads the Jews to an uprising? No. 
Jesus is exactly the opposite, isn't he? He's humble. He owns nothing. He's quiet. You know? And he speaks about God. He's more of a prophet than the kind of king that they are looking for. So, one more thing. One of my favorite um, little, it's not really a poem, but it's a writing, is called One Sol Solitary Life. Uh, can you see that? Alright. So, thinking about Jesus, thinking about who he was. Um, this was written this last century. Um, it's called One Solitary Life. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman, Mary, right? He grew up in another village, obscure village, where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. So he grew up in Nazareth, right? Nazareth is a little backwoods city. Um, then, for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. Listen up, you guys listening? He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He did, some of, he did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. While he was still young, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. Remember Peter deserting him? He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only pieces of property he owned, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Two thousand years have come and gone. And today he is still the central figure for much of the human race. All the armies that marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of humankind upon this earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. So, um, when we call Jesus our Lord, we're really referring to Jesus as our king, aren't we? And when we think about the meaning of this king, we're thinking about this kind of stuff. Right? The power of what Jesus did, not by um, using an army, not by violence, not by any of the things that we often think a king does, but instead through gifts of love, through self-sacrifice, through caring for others, by serving, by showing compassion, by living as the best king there ever could be by our definition that we used, right? Defining who Jesus is as king, okay? Um, so, I really want us to try and understand Jesus as those three people, prophet, priest, and king. Because it helps us to get a, a greater sense of the depth of who Jesus was. Because n none of those three completely tells it all. Okay, really important. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as we come before you tonight, thinking about you as our King, we give you thanks. Because we know you are a loving God, a loving King, one who has ultimate compassion, so much compassion that you died for us, for our sin. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for being our king, guiding us to better lives, lives that seek to care and love for each other as well. Bless us in our conversation tonight, and in your name we pray. Amen.